So, welcome to the first, third, the last but not least uh, round of the Lightning Talks. Today we have just 30 minutes, uh, seven talks are waiting for us. Um, we will try to do it fast. Um, how was the conference until now? Okay. Uh, Dion uh, is going to talk to us about Perl NumPy with Borium. Hi guys. Test test. All right. Perfect. Okay, so um, in my first life, I was a geophysicist in uh, Copenhagen. Um, and to understand my talk, you have to know what a geophysicist does. So uh, they are imagined like this, but actually uh, what I did was make this, run on that, to get that. Um, so this is a representation of the of the Atlantic, and uh, here you see the, the some funny stuff going on at the equator, and here's the Gulf Stream, and it's all pretty fancy. And uh, but to uh, make this run, uh, you have to be experienced with Fortran, unfortunately, uh, and a lot of people don't want to learn Fortran for good reasons. And um, yeah, so. I worked at Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen to uh, rewrite this to NumPy. Um, it worked fairly well, actually, because it's mostly just number crunching and loops over arrays, and you don't do anything fancy there. So the 11,000 line code base in Fortran was ported into NumPy by myself uh, in a couple of months. And um, well, obviously, to run on this, you need something uh, more powerful than NumPy, and in this case, it was Borium, and Borium is uh, developed at, uh, also at Niels Bohr Institute by my colleagues from eScience, or my former colleagues. And uh, Borium is actually a framework that JIT compiles NumPy code to something more efficient, to lower level code. It's still um, quite experimental, probably not uh, production ready, but I think it's a cool product and it deserves a lot more uh, attention than it gets. So uh, I was going to showcase something, but you see it already. Uh, but I can prepare it. So I ran this a couple of hours earlier, so you have to believe me in this case. So I set up a very simple benchmark, and in this case I just import NumPy and some timing, and this is my benchmark. So I just do some meaningless stuff with uh, an array that is uh, 100 million numbers, if I didn't miscount. And uh, yeah, I just add them and sum them, and there's nothing meaningful. And um, if I run this with NumPy, then every iteration takes like nine seconds until I run out of patience and uh, abort it. Um, so the cool thing about Borium is actually that it uses the exact same API as NumPy. So all you need to change to use Borium is import Borium as MP. And um, everything else is exactly the same. So And the, the parts that are not implemented in Borium uh, it actually falls back to NumPy. So uh, you lose some performance, but it, every code that runs NumPy will work if you don't encounter a bug. Um, and all I changed here was adding a, a flush. So because uh, Borium is lazily evaluated, so to make a meaningful benchmark, I need to force it to calculate something, and you see it's already, uh, what is that, 20 times faster, because I ran it on a cluster that has 24 cores. So I think it, it scales quite well. And um, so the question has to be asked, uh, can we go faster? And actually, my cluster also has some uh, fancy GPUs on it. And uh, so I tell it instead to use uh, CUDA as the back end and uh, use the exact same code again. And uh, it does go faster. So this is a 500, uh, factor 500 speed up compared to pure NumPy. And that's my talk. So you should check out Borium, uh, make some pull requests. It's a project that deserves many contributors because it's awesome. Thank you, Dion. Next one, Oliver. Uh, who knows the PEP 515? 
It is the new thing in the Python 3.6 uh, that allows you to write uh, integers uh, with underscores in them, uh, which is practical. So if HDMI? you HDMI here. Ah. So 515, uh, you, you have the literal, numerical literals that uh, you can write with uh, underscores in them, so it allows you to write numbers like million with one underscore zero zero zero, underscore zero zero zero. Uh, don't be surprised when you uh, work with your Chinese colleagues uh, in Python that they will group it in four digits together, because uh, Chinese, they don't have a number for a million, but they have a number for 10,000. Go on, Oliver. All right. Um, hey everyone, my name is Oliver and I think um, we all have been dealing enough with um, bad data, missing data, but now I want to put the focus on, on a specific type of data, um, cultural data processing. So with cultural data, the, the goal is not so much to um, facilitate an analysis, but it's more transforming one data format into another. So you have really crappy data, uh, really weird uh, scheme, and you want to transform it into a, uh, into, into a metadata format that you can uh, represent in, in a portal that you can um, use in a linked data context. So for an example, um, I'm working um, at the German Archives portal and um, the goal is to interlink all archives um, which are here in Germany, so small archives, big archives, and they have a really differing uh, um, amount of data quality. Um, so when everything is good, we have data descriptions where we have uh, very much, very rich metadata, we have binaries attached, uh, you have uh, context, uh, context, so what, what aspect of the object does uh, this um, metadata field refer to, but often it's not the case. Um, the data structure um, from, from archives, which are indexing the objects, is, is really heterogeneous. Um, there's no one indexing practice, everyone uh, things uh, makes up their own forms, and you have to, to normalize it somehow. Um, there's no contextualization. Uh, um, it's often proprietary. We often get data deliveries which are pro proprietary, so you can be lucky, lucky if it's XML or something else which is already structured. Um, it can be club complex, and it can be really big um, XML files. And we have a big amount of data providers, and yeah, only a limited amount of time. So. Um, we created data preparation tool. Uh, started as kind of a hobby pro project of mine, still is. Um, built in Python, Qt for the front end and LXML for really fast um, XML processing. So the goal is that um, we, we adjust the data, write small scripts, put it in the, into this tool, and we send it to, to the archives, which deliver the data to us, so they can prepare the data locally on their machine, so we don't have to, to do all these um, resource inten in intense um, transformations. So first you get kind of a, a fancy intro so it doesn't look so boring and you get some kind of, of instruction because most people in archives are not IIT people. Um, and what you can do, you can put your data in, transform it, and you can also um, create previews. So I skip it uh, directly to the results. And you see you can directly create HTML previews so the archives can see um, how their data will, will be mapped before they even ingest it in our system. So that's, uh, yeah, we try to um, yeah, put, put the work into the hands of the archives. And I guess Python was uh, the, the, the right choice because um, when you're you uh, called data magician by your colleagues, I think uh, Python was a good idea. So really um, solved a lot of, lot of uh, problems. Um, previously we were using uh, Java, Java and XSLT, it's much slower, so um, yeah, kind of a Python success story. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. The next one is Pear with uh, the power of Git. So until we count until million, it will, be, it will take some time, but we can start slowly. So. Count uh, with me. E, repeat after me. E, R, R. San, Xi, si. Wu, Wu. Liu. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, today I will talk a bit about the power of Git. So, who of you is using version control systems? 
right? Who's using Git? Okay, I won't talk about version control and I won't talk about Git for version control. <laughs> what do you think your, your repositories contain? Source code? Sure, it does contain source code. But no, it's the data which is interesting. I read a book from Adam Thornhill, and um, he's uh, the founder of CodeScene. He wrote a fancy book. Not only the title is fancy, uh, even the content is absolutely great. Your code is a crime scene, and it's talking about the data you can receive from your Git repositories, or even every other repository. But I'm talking about Git, OK. So you use Git lock, sure. What are you getting? You're getting a fancy list of what you did and um, which commits or which merges and so on. If you prettify this, you can use a much longer lock version and what you get is much more information. You're getting who committed it, when was it committed, who was the author or even the committer who signed it, um, what's in there, which data you modified um, and, and, and. What can you do with it? Well, there's another uh, great thing, Code Cities. Maybe some of you have heard of Code Cities, or you've even seen it. Um, it's, it's, it can be used as a complexity measure or visualization of uh, your source code. So where do you restructure? Where have you to restructure for your next project? But you can even, um, with, with uh, the data from your Git, you can do, let's say, boring things like uh, lines of code or number of commits or even a punch card, when was your last commit? But you can do more fancy things like the relationship graphs. Which data was committed together? How often was it committed together? So is there an indirect dependency between these files even though they are not referencing each other? There's a cool um, thing on uh, Stack Overflow, a uh, meta discussion about these relationship graphs. It's um, talking about the relation of tags. And you can see how often are tags related on Stack Overflow. And if you're uh, clicking through, you can um, find the source code of this. It's written in JavaScript, okay, but um, the former thing you have seen here on the right are a project of mine. Um, you can find it on GitHub. It's way far from done or finished. But um, I hope some of you maybe will look at it and um, maybe we come in contact and uh, find new ways to visualize our data in our Git repositories. Thanks. Next one, Klaus. So, Chi, Ba, Yo, Shi, 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 R, Shi, San, Shi, Si, Shi, Yo, Wu, Shi, Yo, Jo. No, no, Yo. Just Yo or Jo. Are you ready? No. Yes, I'm ready. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't see anything. Ah, here, great. Okay, after all these great talks in the last days, I have one where you can safely relax. I like to uh, go with you back in time, about 30 years. What you see here is a game from the late 80s or early 90s. And what we see is a typical web page from the last century. And, uh, well, it's still alive. I've loaded it today. <laughs> and uh, you may know about Mayong, that's a Chinese tile game. And you have to remove all the tiles from the board. And it was one of the very popular games at this time. And you, under Windows, have a lot of shareware uh, for Mayong or Crippleware and things like this. And here, the X in the name. That has been the first freeware version for the Unix operating system. And fortunately, it has also been ported for the Mac OS. For me, as a Mac user, that's a great thing. But unfortunately, the most recent version compiled for the Mac OS has been compiled for the IBM PowerPC architecture. And my last computer running these kind of programs is, well, more or less no longer running today. So I said, OK, what to do? I like this game. Especially, I like the tile set. And here's a kind of screenshot. And this kind of tile set is, well, I think, really nice. 
but uh, I have been unable to recompile this old C code with a recent C compiler. And so I decided, okay, I like to extract the tile set, which is here, which is a PNG file, and also the layout files, which are just plain text files. And well, I wrote it again in Python. In Python 3, which is downloadable from PyPy. Its the name is PyXMyong, <coughs> and it's also the source code is available on GitHub as well. And if you like uh, to install it, it's quite easy. Just install Python 3, say pip install PyXMyong, and then you can start right here. It's installed, and with HA, with dash A, you can get some help because it's a command line. Uh, version I have written and uh, you can also have a standard layout or another layout like DeepWell, which I like, and then the program starts. You can try to solve this one. So when you are at your next conference and all talks are boring, <laughs> which may be not a Python conference, of course, <laughs> then remember there are alternatives you can play Pi X Mayor. Okay, thanks. Time we need more longer tail cables. Okay. Okay. So hello, uh, I'm Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Something wrong? I'm Thomas, uh, uh, this is the title of my talk, so first, uh, it's a bit for a special audience, so first I need to get to know my audience. So who of you knows what test-driven development is? Okay, who actually uses it? Okay, not so many. Uh, who is a sysadmin or works in operations or has done this? Okay, so this is for you. Uh, <coughs> um, first, let's talk about Nagios. Who knows what Nagios is? Okay, Nagios, monitoring tool for yeah, just monitoring physical hosts. Uh, when you use Nagios, you have to write uh, all the config by yourself or you auto-generate it. And that's, that's really, really hard. So you have, uh, you have a host over there on each host. You have a bunch of services and for each service, all the, all the checks you want to have, you have to write the config yourself. Uh, so it's better to use, uh, for example, CheckMK. Who knows CheckMK? Okay, quite a lot, that's cool. Uh, so that is uh, like a super set of Nagios. It uses Nagios as core in the community version and uh, it uh, generates all the config for you. Just at a host, it does a discovery and uh, you see all the services that are present on your host that you want to monitor. Uh, you get all that for free and you don't have to write all the configuration. But still, usually uh, you run some kind of application on your target host. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to write some custom checks. and. So this is uh, just how the, uh, to, to do that, you need uh, to add two parts uh, of software to, to your setup. So first, uh, you have an agent running on the target host that uh, generates text out like this. And it usually just uses basic system tools that are there anyway, like uh, DF or something, just pipes this through SSH to the monitoring host. And there, uh, so CheckMK is written in Python, so we have a Python module there that parses uh, all the stuff. So this is uh, uh, how it works. So if you want to implement a custom check, we need to get additional output from the agent, and on the other hand, on the monitoring host, we need to write a plugin that parses this output. And here the problems start. 
because you have now written your plugin for the, for the server, your plugin for the monitoring server, and now you want to test it. So where do you test it? Admin people. Of course, production. Uh, because who wants to, who wants to set up uh, two uh, virtual machines uh, with a running CheckMK instance, with your running application and all the stuff just to test a little tiny check plugin? Uh, nobody, of course. Uh, so uh, you're tested on production, and what then happens is uh, first nothing happens, and then uh, meanwhile uh, at service operations, <laughs> there is a new check. It fails, obviously, because of course you, you didn't do it right, so you have some errors, maybe it doesn't even compile. And yeah, and then you're back here, now you're back here. You have to write the check again, you have to, uh, to try again, upload the next version, restart all the monitoring stuff, uh, five minutes pass, and then, well, test again, repeat. And uh, that's not good. Uh, so what you actually want to do instead, you want to test this first. And for this, I've written just in a couple of hours, I hacked some small PyTest plugin, which uh, does that for you, uh, which, which help, helps you to do that. So you have a directory structure like this, you put your uh, three parts into it, uh, the agent that runs on the, uh, on the server you want to monitor, uh, the check plugin that runs on the check MK server, and a test, and then you can, okay, you can run it, it's easy. You can test your agent output, the agent may be bash or Perl or Python or whatever, so it doesn't matter, it just outputs text, and you can just assert that it outputs text. And but the more interesting thing is you want to test the check function, the function that runs on the complete uh, check MK monitoring server. And this, uh, uh, this is more complicated code because uh, it, uh, it needs to parse the output and it needs to generate uh, like an alarm for it and so on and so on. And uh, so with, the, with this uh, plugin you can write tests for that. Uh, you have much faster feedback cycles because the tests run in seconds rather than in five minutes. And of course you are called by uh, by service operations every time you break something. And this one I like uh, especially much. It, uh, usually, it, uh, it, for, for the most tests, it would even be enough to write a test like this. It just takes the agent, uh, runs it, uh, pipes the, uh, puts everything together, and <laughs> checks that everything works. Okay, yeah, it's on GitHub. Try it, not on production. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> At which number we were hanging? 16. No. It is she. She. Eh? I'm relieving you of your duty. Okay, so Max, with learn to build the internet. Yes. First, I need to learn to get the screen working, which worked yesterday. Yeah. But you know that PEP uh, 515, it was in Perl in the last century already? Yeah. Huh? So, yes. Yeah. So, hi, I'm Max, I'm a networker. Um, if you're afraid of this, or this, or this, or even this, there's help. And maybe you're even afraid of this. Um, there has been uh, some interesting uh, event last year. We have done the routing days from the Fry from Greenland, the two-day event. It has been in Germany. Sadly, all uh, everything has been in German, so maybe it's not helpful for everybody here, but we ha did some uh, talks about how networking works, how routing works, how dynamic routing works, what are the nifty things you can do there, how to plug all this together. There is uh, a slide set available. There are videos available. The folks from the CCC uh, Video Operation Center taped everything, and the, um, some of the labs are available too. So if there is some need here for uh, learning how to build the internet and do this on Linux because Linux is cool and everything works there and if not, we can fix it, then go to my blog. There are links to the slides and the labs and the videos and have fun and build great networks. Thank you. Uh, 
there was a question in Telegram whether we have time for one more talk. I wanted to give extract the last one because there is my name, but it's just a placeholder. Come to the stage. Uh, here is like with like small cap of uh, some cable. Is it yours? He doesn't have a laptop, he needs a laptop. Okay, so I'm going to give the last short lightning talk. We have three last minutes. Um, my, the title was Thank You for Traveling. Uh, I have a slight problem with Deutsche Bahn or Deutsche Bahn has a problem with me. Uh, on the website, I registered with my last name, Shady V. Uh, it, sounds, it, it looks well. It is a legal UTF-8 uh, character, Unicode character. <laughs> It, it is even on the official list of uh, registration desk at uh, PyCon. <laughs> um, but the problem is that uh, I get four different views on my data uh, by Deutsche Bahn. I get the Bahn card, the customer card. Uh, then I get sometimes letters. I print online tickets. And I don't know so many different encodings that Deutsche Bahn knows because uh, on the Deutsche ba on the Bahn card there was a small black square instead of ash. Uh, on the on the online tickets uh, there was a cross, uh, and online no, on in the on the letters printed letters uh, the ash was missing entirely, which the post delivery man uh, actually didn't find my post box at home. Uh, Similar problem I have with Amazon. Uh, the, packet, the, the packages, uh, the mail comes uh, with a question mark instead of ash. Uh, always uh, when I have problems with different companies like this here in Germany, I write them. Uh, I know how to use, do it. I'm IT, I have some experience with it. Here is my, you have my contact uh, data. Uh, you know, I know that nobody from you can do anything with that. Uh, I would like to ask you one other thing. Um, uh, if you do a web form where you, I can enter my first name, last name, and if I write my last name, or I've heard from Jürgen here when he wanted to enter his first name, Jürgen, we both uh, received the uh, answer, your name is invalid. <laughs> Please, your developers are invalid. Thank you. Okay, you have all seen this coming. You did not want to believe it will ever end, but I'm very sorry to welcome you to the closing session of PyCon DE 2017 in PyData Karlsruhe. So I want to give you, or we want to give you a little wrap up of the conference. So still, uh, we did not lose any attendees. We had 423 <laughs> people uh, here in 68 sessions. Uh, uh, which was really great. Um, and as always, as so many people come together, yeah, you know, like many people, and many people means problems, but we're very happy to show you our code of conduct report because we don't have anything to report, which is the best code of conduct report. <laughs> we
We are a little bit sorry, and the Wi-Fi, and the third track on the first floor, we wanted to open a third track and give more people the possibility to speak. Sometimes I heard it was a little bit noisy, so, um, but it was better than nothing. So um, sorry for the speakers there. Um, also, uh, I don't know if you're aware, we also have an Instagram account. Um, one more reminder about the sprints on uh, Saturday and Sunday, and also remember there's some the the, the trains uh, in the, like the local the trams. There 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 are trams diversion on on the weekend, uh, so check the check the plan. I announced it this morning. Um, so now uh, one question: How how did you like the ZKM? And the exhibition and the whole area with like this media, programmers, visitors mix up. How did you like it? Yeah. So, so here we really would like to thank the ZKM for, for hosting us. We want to uh, some, uh, thank everybody who worked here in the tech and uh, keeping the doors and all the catering, everything. So, vielen Dank auch nochmal Sie, die in der Technik und an der Tür und überall hier mitgeholfen haben für den reibungslosen Ablauf dieser Veranstaltung. So, sorry, switching to German, just like because they're German. So, um, so. Um, we want to thank the Python Software Verband for uh, being uh, the, 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 the roof or like the, the, the legal entity of this uh, uh, for the conference and working together. So, thanks again, Mike, who's also part of the organizer team. So, you Two thanks for Mike. <laughs> and the uh, Software Verband, of course. Um, we also want, again, thank our sponsors, SAP, Rosen, Billigadi, and Daimler as gold sponsors. Um, uh, uh, also our uh, sponsors, JetBrains, Yelp, Innovex, and Ypsilon. We also want to, yeah. we want to thank um, the city of um, Karlsruhe, who believed really, um, very, was the first believer actually, yeah? Well, quite unusual for a city, oh yes, believe in. The Cyber Forum, uh, uh, the Duale Hochschule for hosting the sprints on the weekend. Um, we also want to thank again Europe Python Society and the PSF uh, for uh, supporting uh, our financial aid programs. So, uh, so we have, could, uh, have financial traveling support for people from all around the world here. Um, Nobody will go asleep now. <laughs> oh, okay. We want to thank them Focus for uh, because we cooperate with them Focus for the PyData track here. Um, so if you don't know, them Focus supports open source projects. Them Focus funds open source projects because also open source developers have to eat. Yeah. So. Last but not least, we want, on the sponsoring side, we want to uh, thank Blue Yonder, Königsweg, and Python Academy for putting so much workforce into making the conference happening. <laughs> and just a quick check, please, everybody who has volunteered, please stand up. So, um, yeah. thanks to all the volunteers. Without volunteer work, a conference like this wouldn't happen like this. It wouldn't happen at the price like this. And it, I, th I think also it would not happen with the same spirit. Um, and last but not least, we want to thank you for attending, actually. Okay, and now I'm um, a little look into the future, what the future may bring. And we're really happy to announce we will launch PyData Karlsruhe as a meetup here locally. <laughs> and
And Peter wants to tell you something about PyCon DE. Yes, there probably is one more thing. Is there? Or is there not? So we really had that much fun organizing the event and had that much fun yesterday at the social event that in the good spirit of deciding when to organize the next PyCon, we uh, spontaneously decided, okay, let's do it again. Uh, Python Software Verband also said, okay, that's a good idea. So uh, we will be there next year again. Um, I think uh, what we really help is, of course, some funding. Um, so we checked our mails again. Um, it looks pretty good. <laughs> So please, you don't answer to this mail. We will take care of it. Uh, um, no photo. Um, yes, uh, and of course, uh, it's not only funding, but uh, it's also you. So we are looking, again, for great sponsors. We are looking for people helping us into the core team, um, setting up the website, talking to the venue, organizing things, um, designing the next flyer, designing the next logo. So if you had lots of fun here and uh, really want to be part of the organization team, uh, just contact us via Twitter, via info at uh, PyCon.de. Um, I think it's very much fun uh, to work with such a great team. Um, and during the conference, it's something, I think it's a once in a lifetime chance or maybe twice in a lifetime chance um, to do something like this. Um, so just uh, talk to us. Um, if your employee might be interested, uh, sponsoring always helps us very much setting this up. So if we have good sponsoring, spon early sponsoring, we might be able to have a better th uh, third room, uh, maybe extend it a little bit more to one or two days more. Uh, so just um, go back to your companies, tell them how awesome it was, and then come back to us with the sponsoring. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, what do we need to do today? Um, we need to do a little bit tear down, so I think it's not that much. Uh, if you want to help, just come to the desk later on. Um, we'll see us tomorrow at the sprints, if you like. Everything is uh, on the web uh, page where you can find the sprints. We'll start at 9 o'clock. It will be some pizza uh, in to, as lunch and something to drink. So maybe again, hands up, who wants to join for the pizza? <laughs> ah, it's more. <laughs> Okay, and for the ones who are not attending the sprints tomorrow, who are driving home, or like Alexander, going directly to PyCon UK, um, I wish you all a safe travel, and goodbye, and thanks for the great um, conference. <laughs>
that's, that's a team here, though we have a team of people, a lot of things that don't depend on the, on the location, like the program and the ticketing, so this is kind of taken care of, but we look for a local team that's taking care of the venue, the catering, everything connected with a local arrangement. So if you have an idea, so you still have two years to go, but maybe at next year, the next year conference would be good if you would have a rough idea where we have the next conference. Maybe you know something, you have a good location, or you have even a company that supports it, or some other group of people that supports it. So please take this home, and maybe next year at the conference, we will have somebody we can announce, PyCon 2019. Thank you very much. I think maybe we forgot one thing, isn't it? So how you like the food? So, I think I forgot all, also to thank all the speakers and the keynote speakers for giving awesome contributions and also the trainers and the workshops. I'm sorry, I forgot you mentioned you earlier. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. <laughs>